But we're going to talk about today my favorite like long-term intermittent fasting schedule and like meal plan. I'm a big believer. I really like 18-6 too mad, meaning like you fast 18 hours, taking all your calories within a six-hour eating window, and you eat two meals a day. So we're going to break this whole thing down. I know, I know a lot of the people who come here all the time, it might be a little bit of a repeat in the beginning, but first we'll go over what intermittent fasting is, then we'll go over all the benefits of fasting, then we'll go over like what you should drink when you're in a fasted state, and then I'm going to break down why I think the 1862 MAD is one of the best long-term strategies, whether you want to lose weight, whether you just want to maintain your weight, or whether whether you want to even put on muscle and go into a positive energy balance. I think it can work with all those different scenarios. But let's see, I know we got some people in the room already. Oh, UK, Patel, thanks for showing up. Fantastic. 4, 4 16 p.m. in London. Sounds cool. Excellent. And I think I'm broadcasting once again on like Facebook and on YouTube. So sometimes the comments get a little bit low. I'm seeing some comments on my phone that are not showing up on the main screen. So if I can't pull your comment in, I will be able to see it on my phone because I'm just watching this broadcast like on YouTube on my own phone. And once again, um, if you don't know who I am, if you're new to me, you know, my name is Mike Cola. I've been a fitness trainer and gym owner for over 30 years. You know, I help thousands of people lose weight, put on muscle, lower their body fat. So if you have any questions just in general, ask your questions. I'd love to help you any way I can. Well, we got Gene here. Oh, happy Father's Day. Thanks, Gene. Gene, same right back to you. I'm not sure if you're a dad, but happy Father's Day to you as well. I appreciate you showing up. Sorry for the late start. All right, so let's, let's, let's jump right into it. Let's just do a little bit review. If you're totally new to intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating, all intermittent fasting means is that you're you're following an eating an eating pattern where you're going from a fasted state to a fed state. So you're pretty much just cycling between the two. So it's really obvious when you go to sleep at night, you're not eating any calories, you're not eating anything, you're in a fasted state. That's why breakfast is called breaking your fast. So that's pretty much what it is. And I'll give the example of 186 because that's what we're going to be talking about today. You pretty much fast for 18 hours and then you take in all your calories within a six hour eating window. And that would be a typical way of doing intermittent fasting or time restricted eating. And I always like to clarify, if you do a strategy like that intermittently, like once, twice, three times per week, that would be intermittent fasting because it's intermittent, right? If you do that every single day, that would be called time restricted eating. So that's the real basic explanation of what um, intermittent fasting or time restricted eating is. And I see, I see Harriet's here too. For some reason, Harriet, I'm, oh, there you go. You, you, happy Father's Day. Thanks, Harriet. I really appreciate it. I know Harriet shows up every single week too, you know, which is wonderful. I really appreciate it. So I guess I am getting the comments, which is nice. So let's go over some of the basic benefits of what to drink. Oh, that, I didn't want that. I want the basic benefits first. Let's see. Let's go slide number. Let's go over some of the benefits of intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating in general. Well, first of all, I think it's a great way to lower your body fat, to maintain an optimal weight, and it's an easy way to restrict calories. That's the key thing to intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating. It's an incredible way to reduce calories. It's very compliant without necessarily counting calories because calorie restriction, in my opinion, obviously does work, and it can work just as good as fasting. I think I prefer fasting a little bit for multiple reasons, which we'll talk about. But it's really an excellent way to reduce calories and restrict calories without necessarily counting calories. So that's the number one benefit, I think, of intermittent fasting for sure, or time-restricted eating. The second tremendous benefit, I think, is that it increases your insulin sensitivity. I have some other slides later on in here, which I'm going to map out some, some colored videos that I made, some pictures, which kind of explain this a little better. But it increases your insulin sensitivity. For example, when insulin levels are high, I talk about this all the time, insulin is the storage hormone, right? When you eat a meal and your blood sugar raises, your body doesn't like too much sugar in the blood at any one time, maybe about five grams or so. So the pancreas reduces insulin to lower blood sugar and to store away those excess calories. The problem is if you're constantly spiking insulin, so you're eating all, all during the day and you've been overeating, it's really hard to dip into fat stores, really hard to burn body fat, really hard to even burn you know, stored energy because you're constantly in a storage mode. So that's another big advantage, in my opinion, of being eat, fooling around with these fasting strategies is that it increases your insulin sensitivity. So then when you do eat a meal, insulin will work properly. It will prevent insulin resistance, plus it helps you dip into fat stores. Let's see, Arthur. Ella, thanks for showing up. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks for showing up. That's great. Excellent. It's interesting that... 
Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks for showing, showing up too. This is great. We're getting a good turnout this morning on Father's Day, which is wonderful. Okay. Another real benefit I think of, of intermittent fasting that some of the studies are showing is that it's really good for lowering blood pressure. But I did put ADF because a couple of the studies that I read that really show the most improvements in blood pressure is when you're doing alternate day fasting. So alternate day fasting is not an 18-6. It could be multiple things, but typically is when you fast for 36 hours then give yourself an eight-hour eating window, and you keep on doing that over, like every other day type of a thing. I read one study that showed incredible improvements in um, in blood pressure. And then I read another study, but it was a, it was a long-term study. It was a seven-day water fast where it dramatically lowers people's blood pressure. But just from working with people over the last 10 years with these all these in, intermittent fasting strategies that I have people, that I recommend to people, I find that most that a lot of people have improved their blood pressure with intermittent fasting. Whether it was the weight loss or the improvement in their diet along with it, hard to say. But I think there's a factor there that I think it really can help you with um, with blood pressure. Uh, thanks, happy Father's Day to you too. I appreciate it, that's great. Another thing um, fasting can do is that it increases human growth hormone. But I also made a note, because most of the studies are showing that, that human growth hormone increase, these are those counter-regulatory hormones, kind of kicks in for a longer fast, maybe like a 24-hour fast or a 36-hour fast, like testosterone and human growth hormone really go up. But in my opinion, a lot of it has to do with where you're coming from. Like, for example, if you've been eating a relatively low-carb diet, I think you can get a human, so, you're, so for example, you're fasting 16, 18 hours, you can get into a state where someone else may take them 24, 36 hours. You can, you can even be in ketosis with an 18-hour fast if you've been eating a relatively low-carb diet and you've been um, and you've been pretty active, so I think you can get a nice spike in that in your human growth hormone even quicker than 24, 36 hours. But it's somewhat debatable. But definitely, there are definitely hormones that kick in that keep your metabolism up. They're actually good for maintaining muscle when you're fasting 24, 36 hours or even longer. You eventually, reach a point of diminishing returns. Hard to say when. Could be three, four days. Hard to say. Then it also studies have shown the lowest triglycerides. So, for example, when you eat carbohydrates, right, those excess carbs get stored in your muscle and your liver. Your liver can only hold so many, maybe maybe 50, 100 grams, you know, a couple hundred calories or so. If your liver is full to the max with stored carbohydrates, stored glycogen, and you keep on overeating, you keep on eating excess carbs, your triglycerides are gonna go up. So I think fasting is just a great way to, to, to deplete glycogen stores in your muscle and your liver. And I've seen people have real big improvements in triglycerides and, and a lot of, um. Research is showing that excess, excess carbs in the level when you keep on eating carbs, pounding sugar, fructose, triglycerides go up. Great way to lower triglycerides, minimize the amount of like processed like fructose, high fructose corn syrup, right? Minimize how many carbohydrates you're eating. Just be in a, in a calorie restricted state, and fasting is a great way to do that, in my opinion. And this is a real big one too. Fasting upregulates autophagy, and I'm going to talk about that in more detail. Later on, I have some slides specifically that I made. I made like a little picture slide on that, which is going to be kind of cool to cover. It also upregulates autophagy. So autophagy is the body's way of like cleaning out weak and damaged organelles, like weak mitochondria, kind of like re you go into recycle mode when you're in a fasted state. And that's one of the main reasons, and we'll talk about it in more detail, why I like an 18-hour fast, more than maybe a 16-hour or more than maybe a 14-hour, because the longer and deeper you get into a fasted state, the more you upregulate autophagy. And once again, you reach a point of diminishing returns, hard to say, but when you're fasting 18, 24, 36 hours, you're getting a nice uptick in autophagy, you know, which is really nice. But we'll talk about that in more detail. Um, studies have also shown that it can help you um, reduce your cancer risk. I've, I've quoted this study a couple of, um, a couple of weeks ago talking about, there was a famous study done on women who had breast, breast cancer were in remission, and they fasted for like 14 hours every day and they had a much less reoccurrence of breast cancer than the participants who did the 14 hour fast which is great so there's benefits to 12 even 14 hour fasting it also reduces inflammation in, your, in, in the body a lot of studies have shown that those inflammatory markers go down when you're in a fasted state and another real big one in this and this can get a little confusing to people is that it down regulates mTOR see mTOR is like the growth signaling within the body People who are concerned with longevity, people who are concerned about just constantly eating like too high of a protein type diet because protein stimulates mTOR as well. It's just think like besides good things growing in the body, also some bad things can possibly grow in the body if you're constantly in a growth mode. So when you're fasting, it downregulates mTOR and then upregulates the opposite, the AMPK, the sirtuin. So you're pretty much going into like repair mode. 
And it, this is all correlated with autophagy. So being in an empty state when you're dipping into stored energy, you know, some people say it's like, like a modified version of a starvation mode where the body says, you know what, we don't have an abundance of calories now. Let's rebuild and fix the body. And that's another real benefit of calorie restriction and intermittent fasting. Okay, so let's talk about also, you know, because people, people ask me about this all the time. Like, what do you drink? Like, what what is a fasted state really consist of? Well, obviously, the quick question would be, you just can't take in any calories, you know, when you're fasting. But there's even some little modifications. So that, like, the purest and cleanest way to do it would be just to drink water when you're fasting. So when you're fasting for 18 hours, drink a ton of water. And I prefer mineral water because it's high in minerals. You get a little magnesium, potassium. That's why I love Pellegrino water. We're always talking about it. I know when Jeff's here and... When Joe's here, they, they normally show up, maybe Father's Day, they might be busy today. They are always drinking Pellegrino water like me. With men, you're gonna put a little bit like a slice of lemon in there, a slice of cucumber. And that's still very clean fasting. Also, um, black coffee, plain tea. Was there a calorie or two in a cup of black coffee? That's what I'm drinking right here. That's a, Those are great liquids to drink, you know, when you're in a fasted state. Plus, it can, can suppress your appetite a little bit, taking a little caffeine, a little coffee. I think it's good to put maybe a slice of lemon, a slice of cucumber. You can even do apple cider vinegar. You know, Thomas the Law, he's the apple cider vinegar guy on YouTube. You may follow him too. You know, see, apple cider vinegar, I've talked about this in the past, has acidic acid in it. And acidic acid helps clear glucose, which is great. So sometimes before a meal, I'll do a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar in like a mineral water. And it helps control glucose, blood sugar post-meal. But even on an empty stomach, there's pretty much no calories in apple cider vinegar. It's a good thing to do to drink in mineral water, especially if you look at if you get a little hungry, because it has good flavor to it. A tablespoon of apple cider vinegar. Don't do it straight, it'll burn your esophagus. Put it in mineral water, put it in Pellegrino. I think it's a great thing to do. And then I'm pretty okay with this, but some people might call this dirty fasting. I think you can definitely, if you want to, put a little bit of cream. You know, like half a teaspoon of cream in your coffee. Same thing in your, with your tea. If you want to put a teeny bit of milk in your tea, we're talking minimal calories. See, if you if you're adding five, ten calories, something like that, I don't think it's really going to um, affect your fast too much. You're going to burn up those five, ten calories quickly. You may get you get a minimal spike in insulin, and you'll be okay. I think it's okay to do that. Same thing with diet sodas. I don't really recommend the diet sodas because I find that even with stevia and monk fruit, those sweeteners, that they kind of like spark um, appetite. They make people actually hungrier. Because sometimes the body will sense the sweetness and it will release insulin. And if there's no calories there, it like drops blood sugar, then you become really hungry. So it depends on you, you know? If you can drink diet soda or those artificially sweetened type drinks like Crystal Light, things like that, and not get hungry from them, I think it's okay. But if you find that it's gonna make you hungry, I would avoid the, um, the sweetened beverages, even though they're no calories. Let's see, Geese here, good morning, happy, oh, good morning, happy Father's Day, White Plains. Oh, that's pretty good. Uh, MD Maryland, I think I, I think I got that wrong last time. I said, I, I, I don't know, with my dyslexia, sometimes I messed up. I thought you said MD, I think it was Maryland, which is great. Pretty cool. Thanks for showing up, Guy. I appreciate it. And then we have um, those essential amino acids. I talk about that a lot. See, essential amino acids is a way of taking in protein because I'm a big believer in taking in enough protein when you're doing these fasting strategies like getting good nutrition. That's why I like 18-6-2 mad because with two meals a day, you really can take in enough protein. But another little bit of a hack when it comes to drinking a liquid when you're fasting is taking an essential amino acid supplement. So you're getting all the nine essential amino acids with minimal calories, maybe five, 10, 15 calories. And it's a good way to keep your protein uptake, especially if you're working out all the time. And we're gonna talk about some research saying that it might be a good idea to take in some protein earlier in the day, but we'll talk about that later on. And then there's another thing here too, I wanna to talk about this. A lot of people ask me, oh, Mike, will a bulletproof coffee break a fast? Can I put MCT oils, those medium chain triglyceride oils in, um, in my coffee or do put butter in my coffee? That's what a kind of like bulletproof coffee is. And it depends on how you're defining fasting. If you're defining fasting like a spike in insulin, you know, coffee with butter in it or MCT oils really won't spike insulin. So if you're defining it like that, I think it's okay. But if you're defining it like calories, then obviously taking in fat or things like that will um, will break your fast. So it's really up to you. Some people find it like I just read Dave Aspires. He's the Bulletproof Guy's whole book 
on intermittent fasting. He released it about six months ago, and he talked about so many different techniques in which you can still take in some calories while without getting this spike in insulin without breaking your fast. So that's his whole take. And so that's kind of up to you, but calories count, so just keep that in mind. Let's see what we got here. We, we, uh, I was fasting for 22 hours yesterday. My results were glucose 77. Ooh, that's nice. Ketones 1.3. Wow, you're, you're cooking. I went to walk my dog for 30 minutes. Took it again. Glucose was was 32 and ketones 0.9. Why was my why was my glucose so low? You know, it's really hard to say, especially when your um, ketones are 1.5. It's it's interesting. I'm assuming it was an easy walk because sometimes if you're exercising, especially as it's, it's interesting when you're exercising hard. Sometimes, like the, the the liver can put out glucose, right? Because you're in the fight or flight response. Sometimes, and and that can raise um, glucose. Sometimes, when you get dehydrated, you know the blood sugar concentration increases. That could increase glucose. Why did it go down? You probably just burnt up a little bit of the sugar ro- rotating through your blood. You know, three point two. But then your ketones went down, so you burned some ketones. I, I wouldn't worry about it. You know, hard to say. Hard to say why. But pretty cool. If people don't know what what, what we're talking about here. He's measuring, he must have a monitor. I don't know if he's doing blood, most likely blood. He's measuring how much sugar is in his bloodstream, the glucose, you know, which is kind of nice. Is You know, you want it to be, say, under 100. He had 77. And the ketones, so he's in ketosis because he had 1.3. So he's measuring the amount of ketones. The ketones is when the liver is converting body fat into ketone bodies, like beta-hydroxybutyrate. And you can burn that as fuel. It's like the optimal fat-burning state, really cool. Oh, Gene, hey, Gene gave you another super chat. I appreciate it, Gene. So nice of you. Every, every Sunday, Gene always gives me a super chat. I really appreciate it. Let's see, super chat. Dropped the ball on the very low-carb diet last Friday. I will start again tomorrow as there is a big Father's Day dinner later. You know, I totally agree. That's fine. I, Gene, I think you're doing great. I mean, your numbers were good, good last week. One day where you carb up, maybe, I don't think it's fine. Actually, last night... I was do. I was really good. I'm going to show you some of my meals that I've been eating this week. I've been really strict this week, so I just felt flat last night. I always, that's like a bodybuilding term. I just felt like my veins weren't showing anymore. My arms. I felt like I was really depleted. I must have been in ketosis, pretty good ketosis. I don't really measure mine, like Ricky does. Um, I used to years ago. I just I don't, I don't want to spend the money on the strips and all that. One time, eventually, I'm going to get a 24 hour glucose monitor, which I definitely want to try that for sure. But I felt so flat last night that I did have. One of my favorite things last night, kind of like a pre-Father's Day, like cheap meal. I had some Italian bread, which I love, but I get it from Arthur Avenue, like in the Bronx, where all you, when you look at the label, all you see is like yeast, flour, you know what I mean? It's a real simple, real basic type bread. And then I had some French mozzarella and some extra virgin olive oil. I loved it. But I carved up and I feel, I must be two pounds heavy today because I think I filled up my muscles with some glycogen. I'm holding a little bit more water. I feel like I look better and feel, I feel I feel pretty good today, you know, which is really great. Let's see. God dang TV, this is good, okay. Oh, is Old Med once a week good for fat loss? I usually eat two Med Monday through Saturday. I think it's great, Old Med once a week. I think it's really good. Depends what your goals are. That's kind of like what I do. I'm assuming, um, but look at it like this. Most people when they do the Old Med, and I bet you this would be you, you'll probably be a day where you'll be really restricting calories because you're only eating one meal a day, I think, which is great. So if you're looking to lose some body fat, I think Old Med once a week, I think is a great strategy. That'll be your low calorie day. And then the fact that you're doing two mad most of the week, you could be in a calorie deficit, you could be in maintenance calorie, maintenance, maintenance calories. Two mad is so flexible. You can do anything you want with it. That's what we're gonna talk about here. You can easily be in a deficit if you want to, you can easily be a maintenance. You can even be in a, in a positive energy balance, eating two meals a day, and you can take in enough protein. You can take in an adequate amount of vitamins and minerals, nutrients, potassium, magnesium. I think Tumad, I really like Tumad a lot. I think it's such a good long-term strategy. Like, for example, if you were doing OMAD every single day, I think that's a short-term strategy. I talk about it all the time because you'll be restricting calories too aggressively, most people, you know? Let's see. Yes, easy walk. And yeah, you know, it's hard to say why, why that happened. I just think that easy walk, you burned up a little bit of sugar that's going to the blood. If you've been in, if, if you would, you know, that's pretty good ketosis, 1.3 and, and, and glucose 77 is also excellent. You're like a fat burner, you know, and you just deplete a little bit of that sugar probably from the walk, which is great. And maybe, maybe even, um, hard to say, hard to say, but I wouldn't be concerned about it as long as you felt okay. If you started getting shaky, you started getting like lightheaded, then you know, it, it may have been not, not an issue, but it may say maybe you want to eat a little bit more 
over taking a little bit more carbs or something like that. You know, those high fiber type carbs. Okay, so let's go. Right, so that was an important thing to point out. Depending upon how you define fasting, if you, if you define fasting as a spike in insulin, then it's okay if you take in some fat. But I, I would define um, taking in like oil or fat calories as breaking your fast. Because I'm a big believer in the, one of the biggest benefits of intermittent fasting is the restriction of calories. Okay. And let's also talk about why, this is one of my little diagrams here, like why intermittent fasting works. So first of all, like I talk about, it's a simple way of allowing the body to dip into stored energy, stored fat, stored carbohydrates. Just think when there's no sugar running through your system or there's like your blood, what I mean by your blood sugar is low, it's easy to dip into stored energies because there's no, there's no calories circulating through your system. Let's see. Yeah, I'm more animal based. I eat probably almost two pounds of meat. I'm oh, well, no, that's great. No, I like that. I, I I'm I'm a I'm a high protein guy, you know for sure. And I think you util I think you will utilize that protein too, and you can do that with two mat. But to try to take in like two pounds of meat in one meal, that's a little excessive. But you can do a hundred grams twice a day, right? I think you can do that with two mat. So maybe like the that all mat day once a week, you're taking a hundred grams of protein, maybe half the amount of calories you typically would be be a nice calorie deficit day, right? Also a good day to do some, maybe some easy aerobics, like take a nice two hour walk or 90 minute walk or something. So fasting, in my opinion, really creates that environment where it's easier for the body to oxidize, to release fat to be burned up because you know, you know, you're not in storage mode. Also, like I said, an incredible way to reduce calories. And the, one of the other obviously big benefits is just keeping insulin low makes it so much easier for the body to burn body fat. And I have this little diagram here if you see it. So for example, when you eat, when you eat a potato or an apple, or the worst is like a fat and a carb combined together like a donut, the body, the pancreas produces insulin, but the excess um, glucose, the excess carbs go into the muscles, go into the liver, and then the fat goes into fat cells, right? Or you can even convert carbohydrates to fat if you're just eating too much. If you're always, even if you're just eating, say a maintenance amount of calories, but you're eating six, seven meals a day. In my personal opinion, I know some people will disagree with me, I think it will be harder to dip into stored energy. Well, because you're constantly spiking insulin. That's just my own opinion, okay? And then it can even, like I said, it can even put you in a mild state of ketosis, which is kind of nice. An 18 hour fast, if you've been eating relatively low carb and pretty active, and there's a lot of health benefits to dipping into a mild state of ketosis. You can get into a mild state of ketosis with an 18 hour fast. 16 hour fast, maybe two. Those 12, 14 hour fast, unless you're eating like a ketogenic type diet, kind of hard to get into a state of ketosis. Okay, let's see what we got here. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, thanks so much. I'm a girl. Oh, so, sorry. <laughs> That's not all I, I appreciate it. Thanks. It's interesting. I, I got a pretty much even, I think my audience is maybe 60, 60 40, 55, 45 gals and, and, and guys. Sorry about that. I didn't know your first name because you have a C there, but that's great. I appreciate you showing up. Cool. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. So let's go over all the different types, and then we'll focus in on like the gist of this um, live stream on the 18.6. But I think there's benefits to all different types of fasting. This 12 to 14 hour fast, right? That's the easiest way to get started. You know, you pretty much go to sleep at night, don't eat anything, don't wake up and eat anything. You wake up in the morning. Maybe you delay breakfast 90 minutes, you eat dinner maybe an hour earlier, and you got your 12, 14 hour fast going there. That's a great way to start. The most popular type of intermittent fasting or time restricted eating is 16, 8. At, but we're talking about 18, 6 today, which is the next one, which I think is a little bit more aggressive, but I think you get the best of both worlds because you get that uptick in autophagy. We'll talk about it in more detail. Then there's a 24 where you fast for 20 hours, four hour eating window. Then a 24-hour fast, I think it's great, which is similar to the OMAD, very similar to the OMAD. So you're talking about doing that OMAD once, like a 23-hour fast, it's kind of like doing a 24-hour fast. I think they're both great techniques, more short-term or intermittent. Then there's the alternate day fasting, which is 36-hour fast. There's multiple ways of doing the alternate day fast. Some people, some studies have shown that when they look at the alternate day fasting, they allow people to eat about 500 calories during the 36-hour window. It's still very effective. It makes the fast a little bit easier. Then there's strict alternate day fasting where you're really not taking any calories for 36 hours. And even just eating every other day. You're like doing OMAD one day, then eating normally. OMAD one day, eating normally. I like that too. Great way to cycle your calories, right? Calorie restriction to maintenance, great thing. And then two mad just means eating two meals, meals a day. We'll talk about that in more detail. 
an extended fasting is like a 48 hour fast, 72 hour fast, you know, fast for two, three days. I think most people, you know, check with your doctor. I think most people though can, can do a three, a three day fast. You start going beyond three days, it gets a little bit more complicated. You gotta be a little bit more careful. Maybe check with your doctor on that. Okay, is it better to spread calories between two meals? I think so, evenly. I think it is. It's more how many calories you're taking in during the day, but I think it's nice, even though, like I talked about this in the past with the protein, you know, sometimes I, like I'll, I'll make a post or I'll do, I'll do like an Instagram saying, oh, I just ate 100 grams of protein in one meal, and everyone starts say, hitting me with comments saying, oh, you can't use more than 25 to 30 grams of protein per meal. Why are you taking in so much protein? And I, th I think the research is kind of mixed on that. You know, so much of it has to do with how big you are. If you're a 200 pound guy or gal, compared to a 110 pound guy, guy, you can consume and utilize more protein than the bigger guy. If you're working out all the time, if you're older, plus there was some intermittent fasting studies showing that people who ate like 80, 100 grams of protein in one meal did just as well as the people who, who had like three meals during the day of the same amount of protein. So I think that's a little debatable, but I do think it's better if you can. Just for, just for in general, I don't know, evenly, but I would just spread it out if you can, because you can only you don't want to overwhelm the body, you know, with like one humongous meal and then maybe just taking a little one. But truthfully, Gene, I think you can go either way. It's really calories, which is more, and just make sure you're getting in good nutrition. I think you can go both ways with that. Hey, hey, Jeff, see intermittent fasting sounds exciting. Thanks, <laughs> Jeff. I appreciate it. I know you. I know you know it so well. Hey James, how you doing? Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you, to you too, Jeff. Good morning, Mike. What do you think about breaking your fast with a protein shake? That's what I've been doing because of work schedule. I think it's great. No, I love protein shakes. And I do it all the time. Sometimes, even with my Tumat, I'm going to talk about it here, even my Tumat on the days that I want to be at maintenance calories or even maybe above it, I'll I'll do Tumat with a protein shake. I think protein shakes are great. And I like all, I like loose, you know, I like, um, Way like the Rockstar protein powders, high in leucine, isoleucine, valine, high in the branch chain aminos. I like I like them all. I like the plant based ones. I like collagen. I think protein shakes are great. Uh, we oh I appreciate it. Thanks. I appreciate you guys too for showing up. You know this is great. Okay, let's see what we got here. So let's go on. Let's go right to. Okay, why why is eighteen six too mad? My favorite. Well, first of all, without looking at the slide, I just say that I think it's the most flexible like program you can follow long term to get the most amount of benefit from time restricted eating or intermittent fasting because there's so much flexibility with it. I like I said, I think you can easily be in a calorie deficit only eating two meals a day fasting for 18 hours. I also think if you can make a conscious effort to make sure you're at maintenance calories by just make sure you're taking in enough calories during your two meals. And then I also think it even works if you want to be in a positive energy balance and maybe put on muscle, like maybe do too mad with a protein shake or just make sure you're taking in. I mean, you really can take in enough nutrition, I think, and get an adequate amount of protein eating two meals a day. And then fasting for 18 hours, like a little more than the 16, it really kicks in that autophagy, which is going to be the next slide we'll talk about it in more detail. So that's pretty much why it's my favorite strategy and also easy to follow. It's so easy for me to just tell someone, only two meals a day fast 18 hours. You know, it's it's not complicated. It's, it's you know, people don't get intimidated. I get to eat two meals. You know, I think it's a great, great thing. It's good for creating calorie deficit or staying at maintenance calories or putting on muscle, just like I'm repeating what I said. Okay, great for increasing insulin sensitivity, which I'm really hot on that. You know, when you're fasting for 18 hours and insulin levels low, you're increasing your insulin sen sensitivity. That's where I think it can work. I know there's conflicting research, but I think that's where it can work a little better than straight up calorie restriction. Because even when you're restricting calories and you're eating, say, multiple meals a day, you're still getting those constant insulin spikes. So when you're really just fasted and insulin is like crazy low, it increases your insulin sensitivity, in my opinion, better. I think that's one of the big advantages of, of fasting as opposed to calorie restriction, but the research is a little mixed on that. So I wouldn't I wouldn't argue too hard with someone if they disagree with me. You can definitely take in enough protein. That's a real big one, you know, and we'll talk about my formula in some of the other slides. And um, you can get a little more upregulation of autophagy, and that's the real big one. So let me pull up this autophagy slide so you get a little better idea of the definition of autophagy. I made this little slide. I think I put this in one of my videos. Autophagy. Autophagy. Um, it's the body's way of cleaning out damaged cells to regenerate newer, healthier cells. Auto meaning self, phagy meaning eat. 
So you're literally, you're literally like self eating yourself. So we can damage organelles and cells get kind of like rebuilt within the body. People love it for longevity. Some people fast just for autophagy. But another big part also, like I talked about earlier, is where you're coming from. Like if you're eating a relatively low carb diet and your muscles and your liver are always relatively on the low side of glycogen, I think you can kick into autophagy quicker than someone who's like filled to the max with carbohydrates in their muscle and in their liver. But most of the, it's hard to say exactly when autophagy gets like upregulated the most. It's, it's a never ending process. Even if you're not fasting, you're gonna get autophagy. Working out increases autophagy, right? Even just restricting calories increases autophagy. But when you're really fasted and mTOR, right? The growth signaling gets downregulated and then the AMPK and the sirtuins get upregulated. That's like the recovery mode. You know, it's a real, it's really good for you. So some people just fast for autophagy, and most experts will say the longer you're in a fasted state, the more autophagy you get. So going from like a 16 to an 18 hour fast, I think those two hours are kind of special. I think you're going to get a nice kick in autophagy because I've heard a lot of experts, even you know, because I, I follow I. Anyone who talks about intermittent fasting and fasting like Dr. Jason Fung, I, I always follow the YouTube channel. Whatever books come out, I read it. Most people say, and it kind of kicks in, you know, it's 17, 18, 19 hours. So it, that 18 hour fast, I think, is like the magical number. I think it's like the perfect way to do it. Okay, so let's go, let's go back to that. And once again, we talked about this mild state of ketosis. And let's talk about this too, why keeping insulin levels are really good. This is how it pretty much works. When insulin levels are chronically elevated, it locks the door to let fat to be released, to be oxidized and burned. Look at it like that. So this is like in your pancreas releasing insulin. <laughs> I made a little diagram here. This is the fat cells. The, the door is locked. If you're constantly like spiking that insulin, it just makes it difficult. Not that you can't, not that you can't do it. It just is making an environment that's really hard. That's why fasting is so great. It kind of like opens the door for energy to release. Like the, the inverse hormone to insulin is glucagon. So when insulin gets down, glucagon gets increased, and what glucagon does releases energy to be burned up. Releases carbohydrates that raise blood sugar, releases fat from fat cells. Some people call it the fat the fat burning hormone. There's always that insulin glucagon relationship. So if you want to create an, an ideal fat burning state, you want low insulin, high levels of glucagon. And who talks about this all the time? I mention him all the time, Ben Bickman. I think I'm pronouncing his name right. Yeah, why we get sick, that was a great book. He talks about this, he, does, he has a great Instagram um, account too. He does like videos, little short videos, one, two minutes long every day talking about insulin and all this stuff. And he's a professor, so he explains it. He explains it like these complex topics very simply. I think he's great. Everything he says is really good. So those are the big benefits. The autophagy, going those extra couple of hours, really keeping insulin levels lost so you can really dip into burning some body fat, being in that fasted state for a few more hours. Okay, now let's go talk about you know, it's just pretty much how I think you should do it. Like, what would be like the best um, schedule to do it? And obviously, you can do it either way. You can skip breakfast, or you can skip dinner. And this is where it gets a little controversial. Not no, the controversial can, can, can get a little mixed up because both ways work really good. But the new reaches are showing, and based on your circadian rhythm, which is your twenty-four hour internal clock it probably makes more sense. You'll probably get a little bit more benefit if you can skip breakfast. No, I'm sorry, if you can eat breakfast, have a late breakfast, and then have like an early dinner, like a late lunch for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's gonna stay with your normal body circadian rhythm. So circadian rhythm is really important. It regulates like so many different things in your body. It regulates your metabolism, regulates all hormones, regulates like reaction. So when you wake up in the morning, like you're supposed to like get sunlight, get outside, get some light hitting your eyes. It kind of sets your circadian rhythm. It gets things started, gets the hormones, get the gets the reactions going. Also, when you eat, that's another factor which determines or regulates your circadian rhythm. So a lot of some of the new research is saying that you don't want to eat as soon as you wake up. You want to wait at least an hour, maybe a little bit longer. And if you can take in some protein, take in a meal then it's probably better for maintaining muscle mass and maybe even putting on muscle hypertrophy. If that's your main concern is putting on muscle, you might want to take protein in like 10 o'clock, have your breakfast at 10 o'clock, maybe have your last meal, two, four in the afternoon, something like that. But 
That being said, I've tried it. It does not fit into my schedule. I've talked about this many times. I want to eat dinner with my wife at night and when my kids are around. It just doesn't work for me. So I always skip breakfast and I think you'd still get tremendous benefit from it. But keep that in mind. You know, just if, if you want to do it ideally and get the most possible benefit and your main concern also is muscle hypertrophy, putting on and maintaining muscle mass, you might want to have a late breakfast and like an early um, an early dinner or a late lunch. That might be the best way of doing it. But I've been doing it the other way. It works great for me. Well, I just skip breakfast. I have my first meal. You know, it could be two o'clock, and then I'm done. I'm done with a, you know a seven eight o'clock dinner. I think it's another great way of doing it. Um, this process responds primarily to life. I told you my circadian rhythm. Oh, let's talk about this eating big meal. Okay, this is the other things you have to be really careful with when it comes to. Let's see. I think James got it. Let's let's answer Jeff's question first. Those that advocate for eating five to five or six meals a day say that it keeps metabolism up and you therefore burn more fat. Do you think that has been proven false? I don't know if it's been proven false. There is something to it. You know, whenever you do eat, there is like the thermic effect of food. That means especially protein. When you eat protein, you know, you're going to burn up 25, 30% of those calories just digesting and processing the protein. You know, I would say calories are a big factor, but constantly spiking insulin with five, six meals a day, I think it's going to be hard to dip into stored energy and burn like body fat. Yes, but if you're restricting calories, I mean, I did that diet for 20 years of my life. I ate a, um, I ate a high carb, relatively high protein, very low fat diet in my 20s and 30s. And, you know, I was hungry all the time <laughs> because I was constantly spiking insulin and then crashing, spiking insulin and crashing. You know, when I wanted to get to low body fat levels, I just counted calories. I restricted calories. I was miserable. I was starving. I was hungry, but I was motivated and I did it. Um, my blood work back then was not as good as it is now. Like for example, my triglycerides were higher. My cholesterol was a little bit higher. Now that I fast for like, I do this 18, six all the time with only two meals a day, right? My blood work is much better. My triglycerides are like in the 40, in the 40s. I feel like my body fat is just as low, if not lower. I'm never hungry, right? I eat a greater percent of fat calories. I always kept my protein the same, and now I eat a moderate to low carb diet. And I think it's better, but hey, you can do five, six meals a day if you're restricting calories and all that. The problem is five, six meals a day, so many opportunities to overeat, in my opinion. Like if you just looked at it like that, and the critics of like intermittent fasting always say, oh, it's no better than calorie restriction. It may not be better than calorie restriction. But when it comes to compliance and doing it and sticking with it, I think if you just tell yourself, I'm eating two meals a day, I'm going to fast for 18 hours, you're going to have such an easier time restricting calories. There's no question about it, in my opinion, than munching on like five or six smaller meals throughout the day. And when it comes to the slowdown in your metabolism, you know, when you're fasting for extended periods of time, like I said, like when you go 24 hours, 36 hours, those counter-regulatory hormones do kick in, like testosterone, like human growth hormone, even like the fight to flight cortisol, some stress hormones kick in, which kind of boosts up your metabolism. So when you look at the studies on fasting where people fast for like, you know, 48 hours, 36 hours, 72 hours, they seem to get an increase in their metabolism. Kind of hard to say though when you when you're talking about just an 18 hour fast, you know. Um, and also, I think the type of food you're eating play a big factor too. Whether you're getting that boost in your metabolism or not. When you're eating protein, yeah, you're getting that boost. Just just eating calories will boost it. So I, I think both things could work. But I, I like this 16 day two mat. Hope I answered that question for you, Jeff. I know I, I was a little all over the place with it because I have different opinions on it too. How do you feel about having good ground beef? Is a healthy meat to eat? Yeah, I think ground beef is great. I mean, I even heard, I've even heard you know who talked about this a lot too is um I hope I'm pronouncing his pronouncing his name right Dr. Ted Needleman um, he wrote the book The PE Diet which I loved and he talked about how he prefers ground beef over even like expensive cuts of meat because he says you're getting more of the connective tissue you know you're getting some more a little more collagen because when they make ground beef they grind up everything you get in the tongue you may be getting some ligaments and tendons you know you're getting more of a complete profile of the meat as of just getting a nice clean like filet mignon or, or, or piece of um, steak like that, like a porterhouse or something. So I think it's great, Gene. As, I mean, if you can go grass-fed, grass-finished, always better because the um, the fat profile in the meat will be better. But hey, even if you don't, I think it's great. I think um, chopped meat, ground beef is a great way to go, for sure. 
You know, if you're going to the butcher and they're just grinding a nice clean piece of meat, then it's it's no better. You know, what I mean, it's the same thing. But if you get buying just a commercial ground beef, I think it's probably good, and it's so much more affordable. I think it's great. You know, let's see. Does collagen break your fast? Yeah, unfortunately, it does. It's interesting collagen though, because collagen. I love collagen. I take it just about every day, 10 to 20 grams. It's not a complete protein, though, collagen. It's missing one of the nine essential amino acids. It's missing tryptophan. So you have to be careful with that, you know, when it comes to collagen. And it's not as high in those branch chain aminos. It's not as high in leucine. So you won't get as much of an insulin spike as you would from, like, a whey protein or maybe, like, a pea or hemp seed combined protein. But it's still going to break your fast, unfortunately. And I know collagen so well. Like about two scoops of collagen, typically type 1, type 3 collagen, which is the bovine collagen, that really popular collagen, like the Vital Proteins type, the most popular brand. It's about 70, 80 calories. You get 20 grams of protein. So you are going to get a spike. I don't think it's crazy, though. Like when it came to that original, that other slide I was talking about, like the um, the clean or dirty fasting, I would probably put that in that category here. If you're only, if you're only looking for 10 grams of collagen, right if you're only looking for 10 grams of collagen you're only gonna get about 35 calories you know will that break a fast yes but it's not crazy i think you'll, you'll burn up those 35 calories like this and it might be good to take in a little protein in the morning that's another strategy that's why i talked about these um these branch chain amino acids what did i talk about this and the, was it the benefits that's why i talk about these branch chain aminos the eeas because they are complete protein you're getting all the non-essential amino acids and the amino acids themselves are much much less calories than taking a scoop of say whey protein or something so you can get the equivalent of 30 grams of whey protein which will be about 120 calories with just 10 15 calories of an essential amino acid supplement so that's another way to hack this um taking a protein earlier in the day and i kind of do that a lot myself like oh, i may take an essential amino acid supplement at 10 o'clock and then even do my my two mad 18.6 late in the day. And in my mind, I'm not really breaking my fast too much. Oh, hey, Lori, thanks for showing up, Lori. This is great. I appreciate you showing up. Okay, let's see. Lori's got a question for runners. Okay, for runners, will intermittent fasting affect performance when training for long distances, half a full marathon? You know, really hard to say, Lori. I would say it really has to do with whether you're taking in enough nutrition and enough calories doing whatever your eating window is. I mean, I think it can work incredibly well for runners. But you just got to make sure you're taking in enough nutrition. That's, that's why I like this 18-6-2 mat because I think you can do an 18-6-2 mat or even a 16-8-2 mat. And with two meals a day, you can definitely take in enough vitamins and minerals and nutrients, enough protein, you know, enough. I, I, I'm assuming you're not. I think, Lori, I don't think you're a low carb, right? Because I'm assuming you're running these marathons and doing half marathons. Maybe you're eating a decent amount of carbs. See, I think you can get the best of both worlds. You can fast for 16, 18 hours a day, create low insulin levels, burn, burn some body fat when you're fasting, and then taking enough adequate nutrition, carbs, proteins, fats, doing those two meals and do really, really well. You gotta experiment with it. But I don't know if you wanna gain weight, maintain your weight, lose weight. Um, that would depend on how much you're eating during those two meals, right? Pretty much. Okay. Okay, I was doing the low fat bodybuilding type diet. I hit a plateau, which led me to cutting my calories super low and I ruined my digestion. It's digestion. It's good because I lost a lot of weight, but something wasn't right. See, now that's kind of you know that's kind of what. See, calorie restriction, you know, works so well, or like counter calories for like bodybuilders, physique athletes, because just like myself, you know, they they they, they you can torture yourself and you don't mind it because you have a goal in mind. You know, like you want to get on stage, you want to do this. You're starving. You're miserable. You just ignore it. You know, you can definitely do that um, for sure too. But you can overdo it too. I mean, like just like I, I talk to this all the time, like metabolic adaptation. Whenever you lose weight, your metabolism is going to slow down because you're just a smaller person. Your body adapts, your metabolism slows down. But you can easily over-exaggerate that metabolic adaptation by restricting calories too aggressively for too long. That's the biggest mistake. And some people will debate that. They'll just say calories in, calories out. But... You know, calories out is a big factor. Like how your metabolism works is a big factor. So what some research is showing, and I totally agree with this because I've worked with hundreds of people over the years, is that yeah, it's great to cycle your calories or take diet breaks, meaning that you can restrict calories, but then you reach a point 
where you want to increase your calories to at least maintenance, whether take a two week diet break or just maybe cycle calories intermittently. That's what another thing I like about this two man diet is that you can actually, let's say if you just ate two normal meals, like what you would typically eat, you're not gaining or losing weight, you're fasting for 18 hours, so you're getting some health benefits of autophagy, right? And you have maintenance calories. It's really easy going forward to say, okay, one of those two meals, I'm just going to cut back. I'm going to reduce my calories for one of those meals. I'm going to still keep it a reasonable amount of protein, but I'm just going to reduce the amount of carbs, reduce the amount of fat in that meal to put you in its calorie deficit. And you can easily do that. So you can do like two mad 18, six, one day, 1.5 meals, two mad, right? The next day, cycle your calories. They're like, these are all the strategy, strategies that I like the best that I think work so well. You know, when, when you're doing too mad, when you're just doing OMAD, it gets kind of harder. And when, when, you, when you're just restricting calories and eating five, six meals a day, it's so much work. It's so complicated. Like every meal to count calories, five, six meals a day, it, it, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. That's why I love this 18-6 too mad. I think it's the most doable, like sustainable that can, people are compliant with. They just can do it. And even if forget the 18-6, tell people just eat two meals a day you're gonna do great. If you wanna track two things, track protein and how many calories you're eating, you can do it incredibly well. Pre, no, I think prebiotics are great. I, I'm a believer in um, in a high fiber. So like fiber is kind of like a prebiotic because it feeds the good bacteria in your stomach. I'm a big believer in fiber. So you'll, I'll, I'll show you, I'm gonna go over my meals at the end of it, which I always like to show everyone what I've been eating this week. So I eat a high fiber, high fiber diet. I probably get 35, maybe even more grams of fiber a day. And if I have a protein bar, the two protein bars I like the best are the Quest protein bar, which is 14 grams of fiber, and the No Cow, which is the plant-based one, that's like 12, 13 grams of fiber. I think prebiotics are great. And I also eat fermented foods almost every day. Like I have apple cider vinegar, you know, which feeds like a prebiotic, feeds the good bacteria in your stomach. I have um, pickles, sauerkraut, you know, I have a yogurt, a Greek yogurt, you know, from time to time. Um, so I'm a big believer in, in, in the uh, fermented type foods too. Hey, Melissa, thanks for showing up. I appreciate you showing up. That's great. Cool. That's okay. So where was I here? Protein in maintaining. Right, right. So we're talking about if, the better way probably to do it, like I said, is to probably take, take in protein earlier, but it doesn't work in my schedule. So if you have to skip breakfast, I think it's totally okay. It can work incredibly well. Okay. And this is um, right. And this is another thing, though. No matter what, though, there's a couple of rules that you should always follow. Eating big meals late at night is associated with higher C-reactive protein, higher inflammation, inflammatory markers. That, that's a common one you see in a typical blood work. A1C, that's the hemoglobin, like how, how your body is processing carbohydrates. Insulin, glucose, low-density lipoproteins, the bad type of cholesterol, lower HDL, lower good cholesterol, right? If you're eating big meals, even if you're doing an 18-6, but you're, eat, you're doing it really late. Let's say you're having your last meal like nine o'clock and then you're going to sleep at 10.30, it's not gonna be good. So a couple of rules when it comes to this um, intermittent fasting, 18.6, two matters. Wait at least an hour or two in the morning before you eat and then before you go to sleep at night, give yourself at least two hours. I would go three if you possibly can just to help process the food so you really get into a faster state. I would say that for sure. So keep that in mind when you're doing these 18-6. You can go with skipping breakfast or dinner, but even if you do that, wait an hour before you eat in the morning and give yourself a minimum of two hours before you go to sleep at night, for sure. I thought I had, um, let me give you, okay, so let's go over like an exact like meal plan. Uh, I, I appreciate it, thanks. I really appreciate it, that's really nice, okay. So, and these are the type of foods, obviously, I want you to eat, because I do, do think, no question about it, the quality of food matters. I always talk about three ways in which you maintain an, an optimal weight. One way is calories, like how much food you eat is a big factor, right? Also, the quality of food, the type of food you're eating, and the third one is this, is like, um, is food timing. You want to be in a fasted state at some point during the day. Hey, Sheena, oh, thanks for showing up. How does fasting itself, okay. How does fasting itself help us lose weight? Well, that's kind of what we've been talking about the whole time. And really, truly, I, and I, even though I'm, I love the intimate fasting and fasting in general, I'm still in the camp that it's still probably one of the best ways to restrict calories. That's the number one benefit, besides all those hormonal benefits like low insulin and then the uptake in autophagy, and the, those are all the bonuses. But calorie restriction does all that too. I just think that it's such an easier way to restrict calories with fasting 
as opposed to just restricting, you know, counting calories and do that. So that's still the number one benefit I think of, of fasting is it's a great, easy, compliant way to reduce your calories that you're eating, you know, for sure. So, so feasting is as important as fasting. Oh, definitely, I definitely agree. Feast and famine, yes, no doubt about it. And I do, I, and I like that whole argument. I don't know that whole thought process of how we were ancestrally, you know, like you know. You know, you'd kill an animal, right? There'd be a big feast, and all of a sudden, you couldn't get any food for two, three days. So you'll be foraging around looking for food. You're in a state of ketosis. The brain loves loves ketones, and you, your concentration of focus gets enhanced. I do, I do believe and buy that whole thing. That uh, that's how we, how bodies are made to function. So you're supposed to have feast and fam. Like, did, did, you know, there shouldn't always be food in the refrigerator. There shouldn't always be food lying around the house, especially processed foods. That's really good for you to be in a fasted state. That's why. I, I, I don't like to go too heavy and say that fasting is definitely better than calorie restriction because there are so many studies that just show it works just as well. Not you know it, it restricting calories does work. There's no question about it. I just think it's so much harder to do than doing these fasting strategies. But if you really look at the research, I would say intermittent fasting that doesn't necessarily work better, but it works just as good. Mm -hmm. Light dinner worked best. Yeah, light dinner. Light dinner worked best for me. I think that's great. I think it's a great way to do it. And you sleep well at night, right? Which is kind of nice. Okay, so this is the type of diet, and I'll give you examples in the next slide of, of how I've been eating the exact meals that I think are really good. You want to eat a whole food diet. Obviously, no processed foods. Processed foods will kill you. And the worst thing about processed foods are those processed oils, those, those heated, you know, like seed oils combined with like unhealthy type fats. You know, I want well, no, that's what I mean. Seed oils combined with like processed type carbohydrates, like a donut. Worst thing you can possibly eat. So you get the fried, the processed oil, the oxidized oils with a simple carbohydrate. So you get the worst thing. You get the big spike in insulin. You're creating an environment to store away those excess calories, you know, in, in the wrong places. They were pro inflammatory. That, that's like, so you really want to eliminate processed foods, eat a whole natural food diet. But that's pretty obvious, right? And what I like about it, like I said, the 18-6-2 mat is you can easily create a calorie deficit if you want to within your two meals. My general formula is, is multiply your body weight by 10 or 11. So if you're 150 pounds, you know, 15, 16, 1700 calories, I think is a nice deficit. If you want to be at maintenance calories, you can add 500 calories to that or so. That'll probably put you at maintenance. So like a 150 pound person, if they ate 2100 calories a day, they'd probably be at maintenance. You can do this more scientific. You can go online and, and there are different calculators you can use where you put in your, your age, your activity level. It'll, it'll probably give you a better idea, but I think these general numbers do make sense. 10, 11 times your body weight as a deficit. Add 500, maybe 750 calories to that if you want to be in a positive energy balance for a day. Let's see what we got here. Okay. My friend is a diabetic and she does extended fasting for 72 hours, but her glucose never goes down. Why is that? She probably needs a little bit more time. Hard to say. First thing I would say, a couple things. First thing I would say is if she's probably, if she'd been really, I'm, I'm assuming she's type 2 diabetic, not type two, type 1, right? And, and um, she's probably insulin resistant, unfortunately, and her whole metabolism, is, unfortunately, is probably out of whack. Could be a couple things. First of all, if she's not drinking enough um, hydration, not taking in enough liquids, like the blood concentration of glucose can can increase, you know, for sure that can raise blood sugar, right? If um, if she's just not eating a relatively low carb, good diet, when she does eat, you know, maybe her system is still because she's still like a real carb, or a real sugar type burner. You know, really hard to say. Sometimes it just takes a really long time. I definitely would talk to her doctor about it, but I would like to see her more on like a moderate carbohydrate diet. I don't know how big she is, maybe 100, 150 grams or like fibrous type carbs a day, adequate amount of protein, right? You know, like like a typical diet that I'm going to be talking about here. And eventually, hopefully it will kick in. I don't know if she's taking metformin. I don't know if like, like, you know, that can even, if you're testing your glucose, you know, glucose can throw things off a little bit. It does clear, clear glucose, obviously, but, you know, hard to say, you know, really hard to say. Okay. I have, I, I have been, I've been binge eating disorder, oh, sorry about that, and they tell me not to fast, but I keep gaining weight. Do you have tips for how to eat enough in two meals not to binge? Sure, I mean, that's the, conf 
I would say that's another aspect of these intermittent fasting strategies that you have to be really conscious of. They are, first of all, they're not for everyone, not for kids, right? Not for anyone who's ever had an eating disorder. Definitely not. And I've experienced a lot of that. I've worked with a lot of women. I find eating disorders for some reason. I had one guy I worked with for a long time, but it seems like there would be a greater percentage of women. If you're pregnant, if you're trying to get pregnant, you know, I, I would avoid these fasting strategies. I would eat your three meals a day, eat a whole food natural diet. Um, let me see. I think you can take in enough calories with two meals a day without necessarily binge eating. So you can use that formula. Like if you want to be in a calorie deficit, whatever you weigh, times your body weight by 10 or 11, right? And then just split that up into two meals and make sure, in my opinion, you're taking an adequate amount of protein in. I like that, like I'm talking about here, 0.9 grams per pound of lean body weight. I think you can even go more. It gets a little thrown off, that formula, if you're really overweight. Let's say you're 350 pounds and you want to weigh 225, you may want to use your goal weight and things like that. But I think with two meals, if you know, if, if you've been binge eating, you may have to make a little bit more of an effort and really do some meal prepping and meal planning. Like You should never like come home and not know what to eat, right? I mean, that's how you get caught. Like, are you hungry? You're doing two meals, two meals a day. You're not sure what to eat, so you're starving. You go home, you grab a box of cereal. I mean, you're just grabbing all the wrong foods. It requires a little bit more effort, especially if you've been binge eating, to make sure, first of all, get the trigger foods out of the house. And I talk about this all the time. Everyone knows what their trigger foods are, like the foods that when you start eating them, when you start eating them, you just can't stop. Like for me, they're potato chips. My wife knows. Don't keep potato chips in the house for me. That's the first thing I would do, Brandon. First of all, get rid of the trigger foods, get them out of the house, because that's probably what you're binging on are your trigger foods. I don't know what they offer you, but take 10, 15 minutes, sit down, make a list. You know what they are. Could be ice cream, could be cookies, could be cakes, whatever they might be. Make a list of them. Get them out of the house. Let the loved ones, your family, your friends who are around you, let them know you don't want those foods in your life. Unless it's your birthday or something, right? Or Christmas or Hanukkah, or, you know, whatever you celebrate. Get them out of, out of the house. And then you always have to have, like I find that, especially when it comes to binge eaters, get used to eating the same foods, healthy foods, over and over again. To just to make it simple. And that's kind of what I do. Like, for example, I have my core meals and the core things that I eat pretty much every day when I break my fast. For me, and this may seem bizarre, I mean, you may not like sardines. For me, it's sardines, avocados, blueberries, strawberries, smoked salmon, right? Chicken, grilled chicken, you know, arugula salad. You're going to see my meals when I get up to it. And I have these foods, like 99% of the time, they're in my house ready to go. I don't have to think about it. You know, I, 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 I tra I'm busy training clients in the morning. I work out. I come home. I go right to my refrigerator. They're there. Like once or twice a week, I do a shopping. I, I load up on these foods. Same thing for dinner. My dinner is so simple. Nice big piece of protein, chicken, fish, or meat, two different colored vegetables, or a salad with a bunch of stuff. It's really simple. And that's how I eat. I eat these same things over and over again 90% of the time. And I save that 10%. For holidays, like today's Father's Day, last night I kind of celebrated my Father's Day a little bit without Italian bread and mozzarella. And, and, and it kind of stops you from making mistakes and stops you from binging. So that's what I would do. I would definitely go shopping, f get rid of the trigger foods, fill your house with foods that you don't have to think about. And kind of maybe use my fitness pal. Track a few days, like use MyFitnessPal. You don't have to make yourself nuts. And if you don't know what MyFitnessPal is, that app or chronometer where you can track your calories, your macros, your protein, fats, and carbs. It's free. It's on your phone. So simple. Spend a couple of hours one day. Come up with five lunches and like five dinners that you can look up and track just to get an idea with your calories. And just eat the same food for a while until you create a momentum. I think, I think you'll do great. Let's see what Gene's got here. When I'm struggling during a fast, I notice that drinking a glass of water with half a teaspoon of salt in it makes me feel much better. You know, I think that's a great thing to do, Gene. I know a lot of people do say that, and I've done that. I, I think we I talked about too when I did that three-day fast. I started doing that, and I think it helped a little bit. And I do like that Redmond's Real Mineral Salt. It's high in minerals from Utah. It's the, I think it's the best salt. It's called Real. I think it's Real Salt from Redmond, Utah. I think it's the great salt, high in minerals. I think it's a great idea, Gene. Great suggestion, too. And the other thing is maybe a thing of apple cider vinegar, a tablespoon, a little lemon, a little cucumber. I think those are all great things to do. 
It's like, Gwen, I'm 5'1", 151 pounds. Hey, you're not, I mean, I'm not sure what your goal weight is. So for example, say you're 151. If you weigh 15, 16, 1700 calories a day, I'm not sure how active you are. I think that would be a nice calorie deficit. And you can easily split that up into two meals. So for example, let's say, let's take, let's just say, if we times 151 by one gram of protein, it's 150 protein, that's too high. If you ate like 110, 120 grams of protein a day, every four ounces of chicken, fish, and meat is 25 grams of protein. If you had just like a nice, like how I eat, you had a nice piece of, eight ounce piece of salmon for lunch over like an arugula salad with a couple of other, with some blueberries thrown in and a couple of, um, other vegetables, let me some carrots or something fun that you like cucumber, that's a great lunch. And then dinner, same thing, another nice piece of protein, maybe if you had fish for lunch, or you maybe had like a, an eight ounce piece of like filet mignon or eight ounce burger, something like that, with two different colored vegetables for different vitamins, and minerals, nutrients. So you have broccoli, and let's say you have some squash or something, sauteed in extra virgin olive oil, you're gonna do incredible. The weight's gonna start falling off, I don't know what your ideal weight is, I think you're gonna do great, you know? Yes, she is. Oh, she does keto. She's doing keto. I mean, so the girl with the high glucose is doing keto. I'm curious to know how long she's doing it. Maybe she needs just a little bit more of an adjustment period. But see, me keto, like traditional keto is extremely low fat. That's why I very rarely go straight up ketogenic diet. Every now and then I do it. Well, I want to get into a state of ketosis for a couple of weeks. But I still like keto. Like modify, I would use the term modified keto because I still, I think protein is the most important macronutrient. The only thing is that protein can pop you out of ketosis, but I probably would want her. First of all, I think she's, if she's diabetic and maybe she's taking medication, she definitely has to talk to a healthcare professional. Like she shouldn't just be totally doing this on her own. I know a lot of traditional type nutritionists don't like keto and don't like intermittent fasting and all that, but if she's got a decent relationship with a doctor, he or she, hopefully she can bounce things off of someone. But I, if you're diabetic, she you should be working with someone. But this keto and this keto, you know what I mean? This extreme keto and this keto where you're still taking in an adequate amount of protein. So maybe you just dip in and out of a mild state of ketosis. That's my preferred way of doing it. But she may need more time. It could take months. You know, like I've, I've had athletes train with me who we've converted them over from like a high carb athlete to become like more fat adapted, fat burner. And I've had some people take months, I mean six, eight months, before they start feeling right and before their metabolism and everything comes. I mean, you know who talks about this, which I love the book, is um, Mark Sesson. He's the guy who wrote, who wrote The Primal Blueprint. He has another book called Primal Endurance, which I love. Also, Phil Maffetone, you know, he's the guy who did a base building and the fat adapted, like runners. I know, Laura, you would probably love Phil Maffetone. I don't know if you're still here. I gotta give you one of his books. He's great. You know, he's into base building, high, you know, low, high fat eating, and taking athletes and turning them into becoming fat adapted athletes. You know, I'm not sure where she is in the whole spectrum of the whole thing, but it could take a long time, especially if she's diabetic, type two diabetic with insulin resistance, and you know, it could take it could take months, could take a year. Um, you know, sorry about that, but I'm sure she'll. I mean, hey, you can't quit. You gotta figure it out, right? Let's see what Arthur says. I've been eating avocados pretty regularly lately. I love that. I eat one every single day. And blueberries and pomegranate for breakfast with a Primer protein shake, with Premier protein shake, 30 grams of protein. Love it. I think it sounds great. I think it's really good. I'm not, it's interesting. I've seen Premier. I've never looked at the label of what protein it is. I prefer those whey protein isolates. I think that's the concentrate. As long as you don't mind a little bit of fat and carbon, I think it's fine. But that sounds great, Arthur. Cool. Let's see what we got. What do you think about pecans? They may be addicted. Well, I don't know. Pecans, my favorite nuts are, I would say, I like walnuts, you know, good amount of omega-3s. I like um, macadamia nuts, but they are high fat, but they're high calorie. You got to be careful with them, with that. I like um, Brazil nuts because one Brazil nut gives you the adequate amount of selenium you need for the day, which is really incredible. I'm not too crazy about almonds, but this is my trick when it comes to nuts, and I do this all the time. I buy them in the shell. And I like to crack them open. First of all, it slows you down because, so, like, I, I eat like six or seven walnuts most days. Six or seven walnuts is 190 calories. And I also, I, I, and I don't want to have too much sodium in my diet because I do eat smoked salmon. I eat those fish roe eggs. You know, I do salt my food a lot. So I don't. I find those salted nuts can get out of hand. They could become a binge food for me. We used to buy the big container, the ones in Costco, and I noticed a couple things. 
they were dry roasted. But then I look at it, and they didn't like dry roasted. They dry roasted it with seed oils. They added oils to it, so you're getting more calories. You're getting the oxidized. You're getting the unhealthy oils. That's why I like nuts in the shell. Even Brazil nuts I'll buy in the shell. They're kind of hard to crack a little bit. And pecans, I bought pecans in the shell, which I think are great. But to have a bag or a container of salted nuts on your side, you're going to eat too many of them. And if you do want to do that, which I think it's okay, just take out a certain amount of them, you know, a handful, put them in a little container. You know you're getting a couple hundred calories of nuts and that's it. You can easily, you can easily overdo the nuts for sure. Okay. Doing eating with, of course, yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. I think, but I think nuts are great. Pecans, you know, peanuts I kind of avoid a little bit. They're somewhat inflammatory. Let's see, Gene. Okay, I really don't understand how someone who has a family, who has a family, manages to, to do keto diet and not run. Yeah, I know it's hard. Keto, it really, it, it's an aggressive. It, it, it's an aggressive diet, similar to I know you follow Ken Berry, Gene. I know just even, even carnivore. You know, like Dr. Ken Berry, I, I love his channel. He's, I think he's a really good guy too, giving great advice, but he really just eats meat. You know, I watched the, um, he did a live stream a couple days ago with a gal who's been eating only meat for 13 years. It's like unbelievable. And she's like, she transformed herself. She lost over hundred pounds. She looks incredible. I mean, even even um, Paul Saladino, who I like him, he wrote The Carnivore Code. That was a good book. I follow him too, but he surfs like, th he lives in Costa Rica now. He surfs like three hours, four hours a day. So he eats meat, you know, organ meats, but then he takes in 150, 200 grams of carbs in the form of uh, fruits, and he thinks that's a good thing. He thinks it's the, like the lowest in lectins and all that. But he's, I know these extreme things like the carnivore, the keto, that's why I gotta say, back to the, like, the main theme of this whole live stream, 1862 MAD is so doable. It really is. I mean, fasting for 18 hours, it could sound like really extreme to someone who's not familiar with fasting, but once you get used to it, an 18-hour fast is so doable. Autophagy, you're burning body fat, you're keeping insulin levels low. And you can have a normal life just eating two meals a day. You really can. And it's, and it's long term. You're not going to be over aggressively restricting calories. You can go to maintenance. You can go to a deficit. You can even go into a positive energy balance if you want to. It, it, it's such a doable thing. Even Mark Sesson, I didn't read his newest book yet. I have to read his book. He, had, he did a whole book about six months ago on the two mat diet and two meals a day. I have to read it. I'll listen to it audio. I, I've been wanting to get it too. Let's see what we got here. Okay. Only one gram of sugar compared to those other ones. Oh, that's good. So that protein premium. Okay, I have to look it up. That sounds good, Arthur. That sounds great. One gram of sugar. So it's really, really just getting the protein. That's nice. So maybe it is a protein isolate and not a concentrate. That would be that's great. She is doing it for a year and a half. Hmm. I don't know. I, you know. Hard to say, uh, hard to say about that. And you know, I, I'm doing this every Sunday, 11 o'clock. Have her join the live stream. I'm curious to know exactly like what she's eating and what she's doing and what's going on with her. Well, okay, so let's go, right? So, right, so whole natural food diet, right? Prioritize protein, 0 0.9 grams of final lean body weight. I think you can even go earlier. And that main rule is wait at least an hour in the morning before you eat, two hours before you go to sleep, preferably three hours if you can. And let me give you, then we'll keep on answering a bunch of questions. Let, let me show you exactly like what I've been eating lately, you know, which I think is really fun. Oh, there's my other camera angle. It kind of kicked in there all of a sudden. Actually, um, I always like to end the Q&A with, give you exact examples of what I think is like the ideal meal. And actually, I've been doing short videos on this stuff and put it on TikTok. I kind of like exploded on TikTok. I felt bad because one guy took one of my videos. I'm not crazy when people do this though. And, and the, he took a caption of my video, and then he started saying how intermittent fasting doesn't work any better than calorie restriction. I never necessarily said it did. I, I don't know why he took this little snippet of me. I guess he's trying to use me to, get, to build his own audience. I'm, I, don't, I don't know. Let's see. So you're doing for you. No, they are natural, not salted. Oh, good. That's good. So I think that's great, pecans. I think it's, I think it's great. Just keep an eye on the calories, you know, because the pecans are pretty caloric. But I think it's good. I, think, I, love, pe I love pecans. I think it's great. Okay, so, so this is what I, this is one of the meals I had this week. I had a, um, it, this, it, it, it's hard to say how much it is. I probably had about two bowls of it. This is my bison beef chili. My, I made it this time because my wife had a business trip, but she makes it incredible. And how I make it is the general recipes, if you, have, if you ever want to do it. We take three pounds of, of bison, that's buffalo meat, and it's relatively lean, which is great. So first I make the bison, then I put it in a strainer. I strain everything out of it, you know, which is really cool. Oh, Krill is here. Hey, thanks, Krill. 
can't uh, can't watch this live. Alex, going to watch. No, I appreciate it. Go happy Father's Day too, Carl. I know you're a young guy. I'm not sure if you have kids, but um, no, relatively young, right? Um, uh, I watch you whenever you can, but I really appreciate you showing up and saying hello. That's nice. So I take three pounds of the um, of the uh, bison chop meat. But first, I I cook that up, then I put it in a strainer, then I cut up six or seven green peppers, then I cut up one big um, onion. Okay, so after I strain the bison, the first thing I cook, I take one tablespoon. And this is a big thing I do too when it comes to using extra virgin olive oil. Like every tablespoon is about 136, 140 calories. Don't just take the olive oil and just, you know, measure everything you're doing. It takes an extra second just to keep an eye on because I find that even people, I did a really cool video actually, now we're talking about the ketogenic diet, talking about how just being in a state of ketosis does not guarantee that you're going to be losing weight. Oh, you know, my battery's getting kind of low, guys. I hope if this cuts off, I'm really sorry because my battery's looking kind of low. It may cut off. You know, so you can t eat too much fat and gain weight. So let me go through this a little quicker. I think I think this is going to cut out. So if it does, I'm really sorry. So this so I, so the onions, the um, three pounds of buffalo meat. Then we go with one tablespoon of the chili powder. I put one light beer in there. One like like probably thirty ounce thing of tomato, um, chopped tomatoes. And then I take this spicy, actually Mexican green pepper and and tomato tomato sauce a small can i'll list it below this i dump it in there. it comes out incredible the chili high protein kill pea protein i've been really hot now on these salmon roe eggs because i want to increase the amount of make threes in my diets so i've been eating salmon roe eggs almost every day which is great then i also have my avocado which i love and some blueberries you know just perfect oh you're 45 uh i do have kids oh so happy father's day krill thanks a lot and sorry, guys, if this cuts out. I'm not being rude. I may, may shut off because I've never seen the battery this low on one of these live streams before. They used to make something called um, eco-protein, grass-fed. Oh, well, meat bars. That's pretty good, meat bars. But I never see them anymore since the pandemic. Yeah, especially, I know, it's hard. The supply chain is getting killed with everything. It's amazing. There's another one, another like, great meal. I had this a couple of weeks ago, too. I love arugula, high in nitrates, which convert to nitric oxide. Got my sardines in here. Got my... Got my eggs, a couple of hard boiled eggs. I got my salmon roe eggs, some blueberries, and then I and then I've also just to increase the, the amount of potassium. I took one of my celery drinks. This is what I mean by a whole natural food diet. Like a lunch like that, a dinner like this. This would probably be a calorie restricted day for me because those two meals are just so perfect. This is another meal I had a couple of weeks ago. This is a great. This could be lunch or dinner. You know, I always prioritize protein. You got my chicken breasts arugula salad with an avocado, the, my salmon roe eggs. And I always like to accent with fruit. It's so low calories, high fiber, flavonoids, antioxidants. It makes the, the meal so much fun, just adding like four or five strawberries or blueberries or raspberries or blackberries to it. I do this all the time. I love it. And this is what I mean by um, this one maybe a little more caloric, like a surf. Oh, no, maybe not too bad. This is a surf and turf. These are big Italian plates, so much more than you think here. This is at least four or five ounces of smoked salmon four or five ounces. This was left leftover steak from the night before. There's my f fermented food, some pickles. Once again, I've been really, I've been eating this every day. I'm so, I'm so hooked in it. It's expensive though, those salmon roe eggs. That's the only downside. My salmon roe eggs with an avocado, strawberries. This is like, this is what I consider to be a really perfect, perfect eating. Same thing here. I just did, a, I didn't think I did a, a what I eat in a day video on this. My sardines, Similar to the chard meat gene, the sardines, that's why I love them so much. You're getting the skin, you're getting the connective tissue, you're getting the bone for the calcium, right? Arm and smoked salmon, you know, my fish eggs with my avocado. I'm going to be eating that every day. I really, I really miss it. I think that's it. Okay, let's ask a couple of questions. Maybe we'll go into until, until this video dies. Epic bars. Oh, the epic bars. I mean, I mean to type epic. I think I've heard of the epic ones. I mean, those are the meat bars, right? When you're getting like the buffalo, just like we're talking about. I think those epic bars are really good. Those are like carnivore type bars, cool. Okay. I love sardines, especially the ones in the hot sauce. And mm, yum. No, I love the hot sauce too. I generally buy it, the one, uh, my favorite brand is Henry and Lisa's. And it comes in extra virgin olive oil. I really love that one too. You know, but, I, but I've had sometimes, I would buy the Wild Planet ones that have the hot sauce in them. They have like tomato sauce or, or lemon, whatever. It's pretty good. Let's see. Sardines and mackerel. You know, I agree. I, I have to start having some more mackerel. I get it from time to time, but I just love the sardines. I, you know, high in those. I try to take in a gram or two of that EPA of those omega-3 
fats. And now with the, I, if I eat sardines almost once a day, then I have those fish eggs, which I love. And we eat salmon like constantly, you know. So I think my omega-3s, my HDLs are really, uh, everything's really good, you know, which is good. All right. I'm afraid we're going to cut out here. So any more questions, guys and gals? I really appreciate appreciate everyone showing up, you know, for Father's Day, you know, which is really nice. Hope everyone's going to call their dads today or whatever. Oscars and wild planets. Yes, oysters. Uh, is that what that says? I don't know. That's small. Sometimes when my, I have to say, you know me, I, I've talked about this before. I have this dyslexia. Sometimes when I look at a comment, I don't see every letter. And sometimes I'm leaning forward. And so if I, if I ever pronounce something wrong, I misunderstand what you're saying. Don't be offended. It's just me, you know, my brain, how my brain works with this dyslexia. Our food look, um, your food looks so good. Can I buy, <laughs> can I buy my show? No, I know that's really cool. Yeah, no, I have to do my Instagram. If you follow me on Instagram, I post my meals every single day. And lately what I've been doing, even on the YouTube channel, I've been doing a lot of shorts lately, showing you like what I eat for the day, how I broke my meal. I've been putting them on TikTok too. They're doing really great in TikTok. I literally get like 2,000 subscribers in TikTok in like five days. It took me a year to get that on YouTube. I can't believe it. Mike, I just wanted to pivot for 10 seconds. I was attacked as Jew. Oh, sorry about that. Now I get attacked as being Russian here. <laughs> I'm sorry, Krill. You know, this is the only statement on racism for me. Oh, sorry to hear that. I mean, I know how you feel. I'm half Italian, half Jewish. So I've been offended, you know, by so many different people on both ways because no one really knows, you know, what my nationality is. Some people think I'm Italian and some people think I'm only Jewish. So I've been assaulted, insulted multiple times on both ends, especially my mom. It happens to my mother all the time because she has like an Italian last name and um, no one knows that she's part Jewish. So she's been insulted multiple times too. But hey, people are crazy, you know? Got my Pellegrino and lime juice. Oh, that's great. Have a great Father's Day. And no, all thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate it too. Agree, Mike. Food looking good. Oh, thanks. All right, guys. You know, I'm going to go just because I know this it's going to end, and we still got some Father's Day things going on today, but I really appreciate everyone showing up. This is wonderful. You know, we're going to do it every Sunday, 11 o'clock. I really look forward to it. It's like my highlight of my week <laughs> doing this live stream. I really love doing it. Um, I was thinking about maybe doing, I almost did today, instead of doing the 18 6, I was almost going to do one on stretching to be like a little bit off topic, like I had to increase your flexibility without necessarily stretching. And I'm a big believer in active stretching and end range. Let me know if you're interested in something like that, like a little bit off topic, maybe do a little bit more of a fitness one next time as opposed to um, intermittent fasting. But we'll see. If you want intermittent fasting, we'll do that. But leave some comments if you don't mind. Let me know. But everyone have a wonderful Father's Day. I really appreciate you showing up. I appreciate all the new people that showed up today too. And I really appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful day. So long.